So let's get started here. We're all here to talk about best practices for agile coaching. Um, I turned on my camera today, which I don't do a lot of times on my webinars because I'm trying to make a point that this camera is actually our best tool. I wanted to point out almost instantly that this camera is our best friend as a anything that we do virtually. Uh, it's just so hard to communicate through um, voice alone. As we all know, nonverbal is so important. So I'm not going to ask you to turn on your camera, of course, but I just will make a point that this is probably my number one tip when you're working with coaching is this camera. My name is Nick Kramer and I put this uh, picture on because like many of you, I'm sure I've been quarantined uh, for way too long and this is my favorite place in the entire world. It's my happy place. So before we get started, let's talk about a few work from home stats before we started the whole um, uh, quarantine thing. What's going on here? My pencil doesn't want to work. All right. It was reported in 2020, so even just this year before the quarantine, that there were about 5 million employees, 3.6% of the workforce that were working from home at least a little bit of time. So working from home is not something new. A virtual thing is not something new, and it's actually only getting um, stronger and stronger. So even if we weren't in this quarantine, uh, pandemic mess, we would still have to start developing these tools as coaches and scrum masters and partners on how to deal with people in different environments, both virtually and maybe even virtually um, offshore. All of these techniques that I'm going to show you are apply to those same things. Um, about It has grown 173% telecommunications since 2005. Right, the number of employees offering work from home has grown 40% in the last five years. That's huge. I've been personally working from home for about 10 years, and when I first started doing it, you, you very rarely hear that anybody was working from home. And now, everybody I talked to um, before this mess started says they were starting to work from home at least quite a bit. Uh, by 2028, it's estimated that 73% of departments will have remote workers. Uh, and remember, this was before the pandemic. So here's some more stats that I'll let you to look at if you would like. Um, they save, if you work telecommuting, the last one here that I like that I find super fascinating is this uh, 40, $44 billion each year that each employee is offering at least part-time telecommuting flexibly collects save $44 billion each year. Um, What's fascinating about this is I should mention, well, no, I won't, sorry. All right, working from home, two thirds of managers report that employees who work from home increase their overall productivity. And I don't know if um, you're like I am, but when I work from home, I probably actually work more hours than if I went to the office because I get up early in the morning, I check my emails before my kid gets up and then I actually, you know, spend later time at home because I have access to everything that I need from home. So people that hire me are probably getting a bigger bang for their buck because um, I work more and still just charge them for 48 hours. And 86% of employees say they're most productive when they work alone. I find this number completely interesting because it kind of flies in the face of Agile a little bit. Um, as Agile would see it, they would say that um, we work better when we work together. But that this doesn't mean that they're working alone, it means they're working from home. So it's very interesting to see how people learn to telecommute and to cooperate and collaborate together when they are um, working from home. All right, so just a couple, I said that one already. Ooh, where are we at here? Employers offering work from home generally lose fewer employees. People will stick around longer. And working from home attracts talent, especially new talent, um, people entering the worst forks, particularly college students and leaving college or millennials love to work from home and they find this a huge plus. And so <clears throat> if you're looking for some latest, greatest talent, 
uh, sometimes working from home can be a huge benefit. So all this being said is what I'm trying to get at here is that work from home is not something new um, and coaching from home is not something new. However, this is from Microsoft showing how their team software has gone from a yeah, few people using it, you know, down here in this zone, a few people using it to here, you know, tons of people using it. Um, so, and this is just since the first of the year. Uh, so it's only going to grow and some projections that I see say that when the pandemic is over, we will probably um, continue working, people will continue working home from a long time and companies will relearn how to work. All right, that being said, that's kind of my spiel about why we should be covering this topic. And I probably should have said this from the beginning, but if you have a question, please just drop it in the Q&A chat window and I'll answer it in real time or we can wait till the end. Um, or you can drop it in the regular Zoom chat and I'm happy to answer them in real time, or I will open it up later and you can ask any questions that you have. I'm also interested at the end of this seminar to learn about your experiences as from coaching from home. So please drop questions in, I'll be happy to answer them if I can. All right, so previously we had done a webinar at WebAge on sorry, I don't mean to do that, about the future of agile coaching. And I was looking at this, I think I, uh, we did this one about a year ago, maybe 18 months ago, and I went back and rewatched it. It's kind of interesting if you would have asked me at the first of the year if this old webinar was uh, valuable, um, I would have said yes. We also did another one on the five top things that a coach should learn. Uh, and I would said those have been valuable, but now since the world has changed a little bit, I would say um, maybe things are shifting even quicker than I had anticipated. So you can go back and watch that old one on the WebAge Solutions website if you'd like. But on that particular one, we talked about what an Agile coach is. And I wanna just briefly talk about that. I know a lot of you uh, know what an Agile coach is. A lot of you are Agile coaches, but um, what an agile coach is, is there a person that comes in to an organization or a team or even to help one individual or a group of individuals to help them with their agile journey? Uh, a lot of times agile coaches um, start off uh, basically leading the team and then they transition the, the leadership of the team to the scrum masters and the product owners and that kind of thing. But um, most often in my world, I come in and help organizations with transitions. Um, I generally help organizations that are on the smaller side, although I have helped organizations that are on the larger side. Um, but we help the development team and the developers understand the process. We help the scrum masters understand um, how to facilitate the product owners, how to you know, maintain backlogs. And another one of the most important things that we do as agile coaches is we help executives to understand the process and we help them work through the transition um, to make them feel comfortable with what's going on because you know the report that they used to look at now looks a little bit different and we're not gonna supply an earned value thing anymore. We're gonna apply a burn up, burn down chart. And we help them to work through those processes and then also to make any structural changes sometimes in an organization that need to be made. And please feel free, like I said, if you have things that you think I've missed on that list that are important, drop them in the chat. I'd be glad to hear what you think. And we can share with the group on what's important um, for an agile coach. Uh, I also didn't notice how animated I talk until I see myself in the screen. Um, so sometimes, when we come into organizations, coaching, uh, our expectation is that coaching was going to be kind of this linear path, right? We're going to start and we're going to get, it's going to continually grow. Uh, and that, and for some organizations, oops, sorry, that is true. But for a lot of organizations, it's a lot of this, um, you know, we start off, we do pretty good, and then we backtrack a little bit, and then we, you know, move around, and it's a constant moving target for lots of different things. So, if you're an agile coach or you're interested in hiring an agile coach or i would i would recommend that you you know kind of think about this that it's not a linear curve you're not going to start at zero and get to 100 by by the end of the month or by the end of the year by the end of your time frame sometimes you're going to make huge gains and sometimes you're going to have to step back and reevaluate and this is the part that a coach helps so a coach can help 
a team to understand, dang it, a team to understand, all right, technology problems, uh, to understand when they're going to need to have to, you know, pivot and make a quick change or to readjust as they go. Uh, because as we all know, Agile is all about the feedback loops and about inspection and adaption. All right, next. So I'm gonna give you my quick tips for effective coaching remotely, uh, really quick. These are my five tips. Now, when I was putting together this webinar, I will admit that I did find it a little daunting to try to explain how I do what I do as a coach virtually. I did a lot of research and I spent a lot of time thinking about, well, what's the secret sauce? And I really had a hard time figuring out what makes it work for me because I know other people struggle with it and other people have things that they do that work well for them. So I, I kind of struggled with it, but I kind of tried to boil it down to the few things that I think are important as a coach to, to instill. And these are my quick tips, the four quick tips. One is I always like to connect proactively. So when I'm working with an organization remotely, I like to stay ahead of the curve, meaning I reach out to the people that I'm helping proactively. If I sense there's a problem, I like to do frequent check-ins. I like to do lots of conference calls with them. I like to do lots of Skyping and slacking and all of those things. And I like to stay ahead of the curve. I don't want uh, a problem to arise and to it be kind of blindsided. Because if I can see the problems coming, especially when you're remote, you can be much more um, able to build a plan on how to solve the problem because sometimes when you're coaching remote you have to think about the steps that you're going to need to make three or four down the road so that you can communicate those through this lovely device so um, i like to stay proactive it helps me stay ahead of the curve another thing that i love to do is i love to share uh lessons learned, your lessons learned. So what I mean by that is it's very important that we find ways for the organizations to share what they're learning, the teams, the individuals, the scrum masters, the partners, to share what they're learning. Um, we learn from each other, right? And I also like to then challenge people's assumptions a lot, right? Why are you doing this? Why are you assuming that? What made you think that this was the right thing? Now, I like to challenge people's assumptions even when I know that they're on the right path because I like them to start thinking about things in that agile method, methodology, right? Challenging assumptions is great. Um, it helps us to reinforce and to strengthen the bond in our brain on why we're doing something, something right, right? I even do this sometimes with my kid with math. She'll be doing math and she gets it right. And then I like to challenge her. Well, what if, what if, what if, what if? And then I make her think through why that is the right approach or could we find even a better approach by challenging the assumptions. So I think that's huge. And then I also think it's very important that we help people in organizations grow their network. Um, I work with a guy who likes to say, nobody swims alone. And it's one of my favorite things, his name's John. When he says that is nobody swims alone. I think it's a great um, thing to say because we need to learn that we're not in this journey alone. Even if we're at a small organization right there, we have the team, we have the product owners, we have the scrum masters, we have other people that can help us or we have other resources that can help us. All right. I'm a huge fan of the Shura Ri approach of coaching. Um, and what that means is it's you teach something, you coach something, and then you advise. Or a similar way that sometimes um, doctors do this, what do they say? They say, uh, see one, do one, teach one. I, I think the, thing, the same thing kind of applies with coaching, right? I show it to you. Then I show you how to do it, teach you, I show you how to do it, and then I let you do it. And then if you're really uh, proficient, then it's time maybe you show somebody else. So this kind of a see one, do one, show one is a great way. And I, it's always keeping in the back of my brain when I'm coaching, I like to show you and then watch you do it. All right. Okay, so I'm, I got one question I'm gonna answer that says, what is the balance between coaching role, the scrum master role, and the product owner role? Oh, that's a great question. Uh, and now's probably a really good time to answer it. Um, 
sometimes a coach is brought in to actually start off being one of those roles. I, I sometimes uh, start an organization as a coach where I start as the scrum master with the actual new scrum master sitting at my side and we work side by side. So sometimes um, that's the way I've done coaching. I've also seen coaching um, where they're brought in as a product owner to kind of start with, with the product owner that sits at their side and then they lead to take over that role. Um, other times an agile coach is brought in to see multiple teams and establish teams or, or, or to actually stand up the teams. And in that way, they kind of stand as, as the advisor of all of those teams and they help the teams work together and to um, move forward. And I've also seen a lot of times agile coaches uh, are there to lead the transformation almost from an executive level. So they help the executives understand and then they disseminate that information, help that company disseminate the, the um, information down. And what a really an agile coach is brought in to do most of the time is to bring knowledge that the team may ne necessarily have techniques, tools, frameworks, those kinds of things, and to help the team blend all of that stuff. So, um, yeah, good question. All right, so these are the five kind of things that I'm gonna go over about how to be a great remote coach or how to be a great remote employee, actually, Scrum Master, Project Manager. And this relates to all of that. So the first one is maintain clean, um, what did that say? Clean and open lines of communication, right? Communication is really at the heart of what we're talking about because we're actually losing some of our senses when we do it remote. So finding ways to communicate is very interest can be very challenging sometimes. Now, I don't know if you've all seen this before. It's from the five dysfunctions from a team, which I find super healthy and super handy um, about the way that you build trust between yourself and either the team or the person you're coaching and mentoring. And you start at the bottom down here and what you're trying to do is you're trying to build trust first, right? And you're gonna to try to create, not necessarily a fear of conflict, but you're trying to people to understand that healthy conflict and good debate is important, right? And then from there, you move up to commitment, right? We wanna build a commitment and we wanna make sure people are understand that they're being heard and that their concerns are being met, right? Then we want to create an environment of accountability. Uh, accountability between me and you, as you, the person I'm working with or the team I'm working with, or between the team and somebody else. Accountability is key and it's really hard sometimes because people can get a little passive aggressive with accountability when you're working remotely, because it's really easy to fire off a Skype message that says, you didn't do this jerk, you should, right? Because a lot of times the, the, uh, the message gets lost sometimes. So we want to be, learn how to uh, have respectable accountability, and then, and that will help us build results. So uh, if you are having issues when you're working remotely with somebody or even in person for that matter, and you're finding you're having issues, you might want to look down here at this chart and say, well, which one of these steps of this pyramid are we potentially missing? Do we not have any trust? Uh, do we not have um, healthy conflict, commitment, all of these things? So I would start here always. So my first real big tip about remote working is to build really solid communication skills. If you're gonna be a remote coach, you need really super, um, super communication skills. And you also need to find really effective ways to deal with conflict. This is from another interesting program that I really like called um, Crucial Conversations. <laughs> so I almost lost it there. And Crucial Conversations is all about how do you have a conversation with someone where you build trust and that, that they can feel open and heard and so that their point of view can get across. A lot of times when we're coaching or mentoring somebody or groups of people, they don't feel like they have the ability to be open and that they're being heard. And what they do is people move into two zones and right away is they move into either a silence or a violence zone. And so you'll wanna watch for this, especially as a remote coach because you can't see people. So it's harder sometimes to determine, um, are they actually 
participating or not because when people sometimes get angry or upset or don't like what they hear, they move into silent mode, meaning they're just not gonna communicate anymore with you at all. They're just gonna shut you out. So if you're on a remote conference call or you're on a Zoom call like this or something and they just suddenly, people stop being quiet, um, you need to be able to recognize that. It's always interesting because you have to find a way to communicate with everybody on the call to see if some people are being silent on purpose. Now, some people are just quiet, but you also have to figure out the personality of people to say, oh, this person is not normally silent, so why are they being silent? Um, or violence, and that's where you start acting out in a meeting, or you start to get louder or verbose, or, and you're trying really hard to get your opinion across. You, we all know those people in a meeting, right? That you're gonna hear me, and, and, I'm, and I'm not gonna leave until you absolutely hear me. So we wanna watch for those two things in particular, um, when we're doing remote coaching. And what you really wanna do is to find and understand your employee well, your teams well enough to understand, are they in one of these zones, right? And that's about building communication skills, just like we talked about before. So yeah, Crucial Conversations, very good book. If you wanna pick it up, I recommend it. Or the Five Instant Functions of a Team, also another very good book. Actually, the Crucial Conversations, just tip from you and I, if you're interested in that, get the audio book. It's even better. All right. The next thing that I would recommend as you're going to be an Agile coach is to be a good facilitator. Now, I know we harp a lot about being a good facilitator. You have to be a good facilitator. But when you're being remote, you have to even be an even better extra good facilitator. And so you have to really think hard about how you're going to facilitate meetings, conversations, think well in advance about how you're going to handle it. And a lot of times that involves going back to those really super old school techniques that we've always been taught, but we rarely use. And I try really hard to use the old school uh, the best practice is when facilitating, right? So if you're, remember your, your mission as a facilitator and when you're a coach, that's what you are as a facilitator is to always encourage full participation with people on the group. You also want to promote mutual understanding so that everybody in the group understands what the problems are, what we're really trying to solve and we can get the, right? When we under, everybody understands the true under problem, we can then foster a better way to create better solutions, right? Our retrospectives will be better and all of those kinds of things. Cultivate shared responsibility. If you've done these three things correctly uh, as a facilitator, then the team should feel responsible and create accountability here uh, for the things that they're doing. Um, so remember that that's your job as a facilitator. Now, one of the big tips that, uh, that I like to say uh, when I'm planning doing facilitation is you say that you're going to schedule a lot of Zoom meetings and you, or whatever kind of meeting, WebEx, whatever you're going to use. Um, always remember the old standby of planning a meeting correctly, right? Um, understand what your purpose and deliverables are. I'm not going to go through these in details, right? Identify the type of meetings, design the activities in the timeline, define the process, schedule and notify and create those agendas and send them out. Um, people need to know what they're going to be expected to have be going on in a Zoom meeting or a virtual meeting. And this gives them time to prepare and to think about what they're doing and to do the research they need to do. More importantly, when you do this, and I'm gonna show you some of the tricks that I use or some of the techniques, you can build better visual aids that you could display on the screen that help get the point across on what you're trying to get across. And you don't have to actually even create these. You can go to images, you know, Google images or whatever and steal pictures and you can put them up on the screen to even show you this is the thing that I'm trying to get down, done. Or if you have one of these pencils, right, you can put up a blank key, I'm using Keynote or PowerPoint, put up a blank slide and you can draw pictures. But this gives you by understanding what your meeting is really about, you can have the tools and the um, aids that you need to help you get your point across. Um, it also, it's just, it's, I, I can't believe how important this is. Um, at my company, we have a rule, especially since the pandemic started, we're all working from home, that if you schedule me to a Zoom meeting and it does not have an agenda in it, then 
I don't have to attend your meeting because we believe that agendas and this kind of stuff is so important that if you don't have the time to put an agenda together, then you, um, then you don't deserve my time as a, as a participant to have the meeting. So there's that. All right, and then remember the old school that there are kind of five steps to a meeting, planning, kickoff, facilitation, concluding, and then follow up. And I cannot tell you how important this one is, right? Establish some accountability, find a place to keep who's doing what, by when and how. Is That might be on a, an Excel spreadsheet that everybody gets. It might be on your virtual boards. It might be in the Slack or Skype channel, but publish these, right? To say who's going to do what, when are you going to do it? And then it's your job as a coach to, to make sure that the people are doing that. All right, I don't want to harp on facilitation because that's not what this is about, but it is key to being a good remote coach, being a good facilitator. If you're not, there's always good places to go to learn. Give me, a, give us a call, we'll help you out. All right, next thing. Of course, you're gonna have to leverage some technology if you're going to be a good remote coach. There's just dollars to it, that's the world we live in, right? Um, technology is our friend and we either have to learn to use it or we're gonna get run over by it. All right, we can go on and on, and I'm actually curious to know what kind of technology you use. There are, let, the one thing that I wanna point out real quick is this one here seems to have gotten lost in the mix a little bit in, in the world that I'm living in. Nobody wants to make a phone call. They want to do uh, one of these Skype, send me a Skype or send it on the Slack, or they want to you know, um, send me a message through my iPhone. And well, that's all well and good. I. I'm not personally very good about understanding what you're trying to say sometimes. And so we can go back and forth for, you know, half a dozen Slack conversations, messages, trying to figure out what's going on when you could have just called me or I could have just called you. And so I actually have a personal rule that if you send more than about three or four messages through um, one of these IM tools and I can't figure out what you're ta talking about, I'm just going to call you. That's because that's just how we're going to do it. If I need to document what I learned, I can do that again in the Skype channel or Slack channel, but I'm just going to call you. So let's not forget about the phone, right? We get so hung up on that we need to oh, set up a Zoom thing or send an IM or, or whatever, or send an email. No, 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 no. This phone thing is probably, um, is probably the most one that most people are overlooking. And also FaceTime. You know how I feel about seeing face to face. So if you can do a FaceTime call, you even better. All right. There's of course Zoom. Uh, the thing I like about Zoom, I know Zoom is super popular right now, is if you pay for the certain package, you can do breakout rooms in Zoom. Uh, what's great about breakout rooms, if you're doing things like uh, sprint planning or retrospectives, you can send people to their own kind of rooms and say, okay, you group of people go task these stories or point these stories or write these stories, and you group of people go work on these ones. Or during retrospectives, you can do things like half the group is going to do this and the other half group is going to do that. We're going to come back and share. Um, and you don't have to find ways to communicate. So Zoom, is their breakout rooms are super handy, and I'm sure the other WebEx has something similar, but um, Zoom is the one that I've been using lately just because it seems to work really well with the planning activities. Okay, uh, email, TFS, and JIRA, those are good virtual boards that you can get. And I'm sure that uh, a lot of you um, have other boards you can use like Trello or there's dozens of these. Uh, don't forget to have ways of drawing on a screen if you want, the pencil, super handy. And a new tool that I'm curious if anybody's using is this mural tool. Has anybody ever heard of this before, mural.co? Um, it reminds me kind of like uh, Google, Google Documents or whatever. Um, we, can, we can both be working on a screen at the same time. So I can see you typing and I can see you doing your things and then I can actually take what you're doing and move it around on the screen. So it's kind of like a virtual whiteboard that everybody on the team um, can use at the same time. And I see some people haven't heard of it and some people have. Uh, 
Yeah, Amy, I just, I'm sorry, didn't mean to call you out. I would just try to use it. I, somebody just says that it also links to other tools like Teams, allowing to work from team spaces. Oh, so that's great. I know it works, it, it, I think it um, also connects to Slack, so you can use those things. Um, it's a very nice tool. And there are other ones that I'm sure many of you have used Google Jamboard. Yep, it's very similar to that mural tour. And I, um, the Google tools are usually pretty cheap or if not free. So those are great. Um, so yeah, anybody else using any special specific tools to do virtual work from a visual standpoint? Uh, yeah, I just have a client that just started to use Teams and they love it. Microsoft Whiteboard, yep. Oh, I've never used Fun Retro. That's interesting, I'll have to check that one out. Yeah, there are, a, there are just tons. I've been saying with my business partner for a while, if we can figure out and how to make the ideal collaboration tool, you'll be set for life. All right, so some of the other things that I definitely like to do, remember I was telling you about facilitation on how important it is, and let's just ignore the content here, but I um, do a lot of quick graphics before meetings. So this particular meeting here, we were talking about um, how we were gonna do stories and they wanted to do this kind of process. And this was the kind of the notes from a meeting that we had discussed. They said, we wanna go through these steps and how the process works. So I just quickly whip this up in Photoshop. I am no Photoshop expert, but I can draw a few lines, you know, with Photoshop, no problem up and down here. I can draw this, this I stole from, um, a canned image, no big deal. And I just kind of put it out. So that way when we're having a virtual meeting, I can display this and I can say, now remember we're talking about level one here, what does everybody think? Do we need to make some changes? And then I can draw on it. Um, that's why being a really good facilitator and planning your meetings is super important because now I can create the visual aids that I need to actually get my work done so we can all be on the same page without spinning. Um, here's another one, this is a, um, an agile framework that I use uh, that that kind of describes the steps right and I kind of then took those levels and implemented them onto this so that they could see how they fit here and then I remind them and this is all stuff this doesn't take me long to do a lot of this stuff you can get from Adobe Photoshop if you have it or you can steal these images from Google images they don't have to be anything fancy just drop them on here onto a onto a slide and you're good to go. But I cannot tell you how many times I have avoided having delayed conversations or crazy conversations um, that I avoid that just because I can have a visual aid. It's so important. And then I can send this off to people, you know, to discuss what we've discussed. So visual aids are huge and you don't have to be an artist. I don't know anything about anything when it comes to Photoshop and I can make this stuff work. So, all right. The next thing that we want to talk about is being flexible. Um, I don't have a whole lot here about being flexible, just that, but when you're a coach, you're going to have to learn to um, be flexible, right? Meetings get canceled. People get busy. They don't have time to deal with the coach. They got to actually get some work done. So you're going to have to learn to be flexible and say, let's talk about that another time. Let's, let's reconnect tomorrow, right? So being flexible is huge especially in this remote environment, right? People are homeschooling their kids, so they don't have time because they got to teach their kid math. And so um, being flexible in this world is, is huge. Now, my number one tip, and I, we're, we're coming up here, that I want to talk about is establishing a community of practice. Now, uh, and I call them communities of practice some people call them centers of excellence. Uh, they're called lots of different things and lots of organizations. And you can do a couple different things. But what a community of practice is, is it's a way of bringing people together that have similar interests in topics, right? So if you're a scrum master, maybe you find people that have, um, are experienced scrum masters in your area, right? Or maybe in your network that you can visit with. You build a community. Um, that way you're not always just talking to a coach. And the coach is really important on helping um, people find those connections. And so uh, they don't need to always come to you and you may not always be around. So helping them understand that there are other people that they can reach out to that have similar interests and experiences 
experiences or more experience that they can reach out to is huge. And there are lots of different ways that you can build communities of practice. You can do it within an organization, right? As a coach, I, one of the, I always write into my coaching agreement is that I would, I'm going to establish a community of practice in your, in your organization. In some organizations, I build community of practice for just product owners, just for scrum masters, just for teams. Sometimes I build a, a whole one where we can all get together, but it is huge that you build a community um, of practice, a, a, a network, it's huge. Now, if your organization is small and you don't have one, good news is there are lots that you can get involved with. LinkedIn has tons and tons of w groups that you can join. Uh, if you go to the, the meetup sites, generally your organization, there's meetups all over the place where you can go and find um, people that you can go visit with. They, you know, they have do an hour session once a week on this topic and they do. Um, so if you are a coach, I encourage you to establish these in your organizations or to help people that are interested in agile and coaching to find their own community. Um, if you are also a coach and you want to establish your own like kind of online community, there are some really good tools that you can buy or you can get for free that you can establish in your own companies that say, this is our online community. So if you have a question, post them out here. Here's the videos that we're going to produce as a group and we're going to stick them out there. Um, so I would definitely, this is my number one besides facilitation because of all the great things we've talked about, uh, what it can do for you is this community of practice. I belong to several community of practice. I belong to a local one here in the organization. And then I also belong to one out of England. I live in Nebraska and I belong to one in England because it's fascinating to me to see how people in Europe are implementing these ideas, right? And in some ways they're ahead of the curve, in some ways they're behind, but it's interesting to see how they're doing it. Um, here at WebAge, um, we do have a program that we offer that we come into your organization and we can help you build your own internal coaches. Um, so what we like to say is that the cost for one uh, external coach for one period of time, we can help you build an internal coaching platform. Um, and we do that by doing training and, and, and acting as a master coach with those people that are wanting to become coaches or have the aptitude to be coaches. So if that's something you're interested in about building a coaching program at your organization, uh, give us a call. Give Maria a call. Um, she'll send this. Oh, this deck will be available and this presentation will be available. It takes a few days and we post it on our website. So if you have any questions, uh, you can always reach out to us and see. Thanks, everybody. If you have any questions, go ahead and reach out to us here at WebAge, and we'll be happy to answer them. Um, have a great day.